Okay. Um, well, it's six o'clock, so um, I think we're going to get started. And um, as people as people come in, um, uh, that's fine too. I'll just sort of add people in as as they show up. Um, so, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar in uh, climate friendly mixed farming systems. Uh, my name is Emily, and I'm with Farm Folk City Folk. And I'm currently calling in from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, looking more into solutions in climate change mitigation, I think it's really important to uh, reflect on how these practices aren't necessarily new and how they've actually been practiced traditionally in many ways for a long time on BC's food lands. So um, I encourage everyone to take a moment and think about the traditional lands that they're calling from and the history of those lands. Um, for those of you that are new to hearing about Farm Folk City Folk, we work to connect, empower, and inspire people to strengthen BC's food systems. Um, in supporting farmers and ranchers through our Climate Solutions Program, one of our goals is to connect and empower farmers around BC who are passionate about climate-friendly agriculture. And so this is kind of where this uh, webinar fits in. Um, before I continue, um, everybody should have been muted as they came into the chat, but maybe um, maybe just double check to make sure that your uh, microphone is still muted just so we can kind of eliminate any background noise that might be coming through. Um, so so I'm, I'm really glad that we're all able to come together virtually for this webinar. We're joined by Vicki from Thimbleberry Farm. Thimbleberry Farm is a, a small scale no-till regenerative farm producing vegetables, pastured poultry, uh, rabbit and eggs in terrace BC. And uh, Jolene is also joining us from Woodgrain Farm. And uh, Woodgrain is a diverse farm producing vegetables, grain and lamb in Hazleton, BC. And Jolene is also the central and northern BC land matcher for the BC land matching program delivered by Young Agrarians. Uh, so we're really excited to have uh, both of you here. And um, both of these farmers are going to share with us some of the practices that they used on their mixed farms. Um, and then their presentations will be followed by a question and answer period. So I encourage you to write your questions down um, sort of as the presentations go along so that um, in the end, uh, we can make sure we try and get to as many of them as possible. Um, this is a larger group. It looks like we have uh, 40 participants now. So I think what I'll have everyone do is just submit their questions in the chat box and then um, and then maybe I can go through and and pull as many as I can out uh, to ask Vicky and Jolene at the end, um, just to sort of avoid um, hectically trying to come on and answer questions with such a large, a large group. Um, so, so yeah, I think with, with that being said, um, we'll, we can move on to, to our presentations. And so if Vicki, if you want to introduce yourself and share um, your screen with everyone, that would be awesome. So, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Vicki Serafini. I'm the owner and operator of Thimbleberry Farm in Terrace, BC. We're on unceded Shimshan territory. We um, are really happy when I say we, it's a family farm, I'm here tonight. Uh, and I'm really excited to be part of this because way back in the day before I was farming, um, I definitely benefited from a lot of the work that farm folk city folk does in terms of information sharing and resources and whatnot so it's all full circle um so yeah thimbleberry farm we are in terrace that's in the pacific northwest if if nobody knows where terrace is we are near um sort of in between prince rupert and smithers um, halfway up the province. Uh, we are in a coastal inland climate, uh, zone 7A, which is pretty nice for northern BC, but our weather is rather variable. We do get a lot of snow in the winter, and we can have really hot summers, but we can also have really wet cold summers, uh, which is what we had this year. Um, we just wrapped up our third year of production, so um, we haven't been at it for too long, but we definitely learned a lot in those first three years. Uh, so our operations are a market garden. We raise pastured poultry. We have a small layer flock and sell eggs. 
uh, and we also raise rabbits for meat. And this year we did all of that on about a quarter of an acre. Um, our whole farm is 3.3 acres, but we do live there. Uh, and we do also have a big buffer of trees and hedges surrounding our property, which we wanna keep. Um, so because we'll be expanding next year, we just secured with the help of Jolene in her role as land matcher uh, for young agrarians, we just secured a lease for another quarter acre on uh, another farm. Uh, so we are a family run farm. Uh, we sell at the local farmer's market. We started selling online this year in response to the um, COVID pandemic. We sell our meat through farm gate sales and we've also sold a little bit of wholesale to local businesses. The values that underpin our farming operation, our community, we're always thinking about our place in our community and how we can serve our community. We really value high quality locally produced foods uh, and we value ethical agricultural practices. That includes um, sort of uh, environmentally friendly agricultural practices, uh, but we are also concerned about the quality of life that we're providing the animals that we raise. Um, and we're also concerned with things like uh, accessibility to the food that we produce. We wanna be able to share that food with everyone in our community. So climate friendly farming to me means limiting or mitigating the negative environmental impacts of uh, our agricultural practices. So we try to focus on things like carbon sequestration, water conservation and protection, uh, reducing our fossil fuel use, improving the eco, in, sorry, the uh, ecosystem services and the biodiversity and closing uh, the fertility loop, which is, I think is a big thing when you're thinking about mixed farming systems. These things, along with other things like seed saving and sharing local farming knowledge are all things that can also increase our resilience to climate change. Um, so I'll just describe kind of what we do a little bit on our farm. Um, our farm is, or sorry, our market garden is a no-till market garden. Um, so we do break ground initially uh, with tillage, but after that we don't till. We do use a broad fork a lot. We do some surface cultivation, but mostly we're trying to layer things up on top of the soil. A uh, funny story about how we got into no-till market gardening. When we were first dreaming and scheming about farming in our, uh, basement apartment in the lower mainland and we were thinking of how much it would cost us to start a farm we came across the, the tractor and I said do we need a tractor so I literally typed into google farming without a tractor and that basically that one google search sent us down this like big long path that now sort of underpins most of our farming practices uh, so don't underestimate the power of a google search <laughs> Um, so yeah, no till, uh, we like it because it keeps things on a human scale, which sort of is our way of reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we use. That being said, we do use a lot of inputs that come from far away and those have a big footprint, but that's sort of our way of doing what we can in terms of, um, using fuel. Um, it also limits the impact on our soil. So we're not driving machinery over the soil, which I mean, I have no issue with that. Um, there are a lot of environmentally friendly farms that are tilling and using heavy equipment, but that's just not uh, what we're doing. If I could, I would be building all of my beds using sort of the lasagna garden method um, where you're laying uh, cardboard down, you're not doing any tilling, and then you're building up your organic matter. I've done that on a smaller scale and it was really successful, but the labor involved in that uh, is really prohibitive on the scale that we're on. Um, yeah, so that's no-till. We use a lot of cover crop. We plant as much of it as we can. Um, cover crop, uh, is like basically a blanket for your so soil. We plant it in the late summer so that we have a cover on our soil 
for the winter. Um, your soil is not exposed, so you are limiting the amount of erosion that occurs due to wind and water moving over it. We're in a really high precipitation area, so we do get a lot of erosion and leaching uh, that happens around here. Uh, the cover crop feeds your soil life. Uh, it can fix nitrogen for you, further reducing your need for sort of off-farm um, uh, fertilizers. It decomposes and increases your soil organic matter. It feeds the microorganisms, which kind of can build the carbon in your soil. Uh, and we also feed our mature cover crop to our animals. And another thing that we like to do is mulching, again, uh, to limit the amount of erosion that occurs. Um, it, it has dramatically reduced our need to irrigate, which is great. Um, and we also find that the mulched beds that have, or sorry, the beds that have mulch have just like an incredible amount of soil life in them versus the ones that aren't. I can't tell you what's going on at a microscopic scale, but I definitely know on a macro scale, those beds are really teeming with life. Um, we use a lot of natural mulch. We don't really use plastic mulch, although we do, you can see in this photo, this is some clover, look at that root mass. Uh, and this is our broad fork in our San Francis. Uh, Sorry, we use, um, we do use silage tarps to speed up the decomposition process and to put a pause on any sort of weed disasters that we have going on. Um, and it's definitely effective in that sense. Um, they're very useful, but they don't last forever. And they do end up uh, being thrown out because they only last a couple of seasons we find. So we're trying to move away from using those as much as possible. Uh, so I'll just describe how we're pasturing animals and then I'll kind of connect the, the crops with the animals when I talk about composting and manure. We raise meat rabbits. Um, the, the rabbits that we process, we have some of these uh, little rabbit tractors that we pull around. We also raise broilers um in a pastured system and we have guest grazers so these sheep in this llama are not ours they belong to a fellow farmer who didn't have a lot of forage on his property so he brought some electric fence down and kept our uh, our grass clipped for us it was quite nice um so the reason that we pasture poultry and rabbit mainly is for the quality of, of meat that we get out of it, um, but also for sort of the quality of life of the animal. We don't find that it offsets feed costs with the broilers. We do find it makes a big difference with the rabbits. Um, we also have never had any pest or disease issues with our animals, and I think that's because they're, they're pastured. Um, we do have some animals living in uh, like a more confined setting um, and we find that their not just their feed consumption is higher but their their water consumption is higher as well um, so that that can be a little more labor um, the different animals have a different toll on the landscape obviously the sheep uh, when left somewhere for too long really uh, mowed it down Jolene raises sheep so maybe Jolene you'll talk a little bit more about that um, the, the broilers are pretty limited in their impact, although they do produce a lot of manure, um, and you can definitely overload an area with manure, um, if you're not moving them frequently enough or not leaving enough time for, for rest. Um, the rabbits, very light on the landscape, however, they do dig holes, so if you're interested in raising them in a, in a smaller urban setting or even a smaller acreage, just be aware that they will um, dig big holes. The, the biggest issue that we have with, it's not an issue, but what we find kind of problematic is that we can't collect all of that uh, manure that those animals produce. And that's basically how we integrate our animals with our crop system. It's, it's using the manure that the animals produce um, 
and and sort of trying to close our fertility loop. Um, the good thing about it though, is that it has sort of a lower environmental impact because you're depositing those nutrients. Did anyone else hear? We good? Yeah, okay. Um, you're depositing those nutrients on, uh, on living plants. So they're taking up those nutrients and you're not worried about um, any sort of leaching that could occur, uh, which takes me to my next slide. Um, we are big fans of composting. We're not great at it, um, mostly because uh, we're just not experts. We're getting there. We also don't have a very good setup. So our composting system is just a series of boxes made out of pallets. Um, they're not on an impermeable surface like a concrete pad and they're not covered. Um, the issue there is nutrient leaching into the soil and into the aquifer that we're on. Um, we try to mitigate that by adding a lot of carbon layers to try to absorb some of those nutrients and turning it as much as possible. Um, uh, and we, we really wanna develop this composting system because one of our, when we think about our like overall footprint of the farm, the carbon footprint, we, we ship everything in. So, I mean, even the straw that we use is shipped from, from away um, all of our fertilizers, most of our amendments, everything comes from some, somewhere else. So we're really trying to create all of our fertility on the farm. Um, that being said, we, we don't, like I said, we're not great at it. Um, we don't pay a lot of attention to it. So we really only get to use that compost after like a year or a year and a half of processing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I find compost is a lot like growing vegetables. Anybody can grow vegetables or make compost, but if you want it to be really good, you have to um, sort of do your research and pay some more attention to it. Um, so manure is kind of the best thing about a mix, <coughs> excuse me, about the mixed farming system for us. We compost the majority of our manure um, and the bedding that we clean out of the chicken coop. And I mentioned earlier that we don't get to collect the manure from our pastured animals, but our layers are in a chicken coop with a, a, like a movable run. Um, so we're able to clean out that bedding. And we also have a couple rows of these um, uh, rabbit hutches. So we're able to collect the manure from under those as well. That all goes into the compost. Um, the question that was posed uh, in the registration forms was um, application of raw manure or, or putting animals directly on the land. We don't do that because we need to consider sort of the, the food safety element. <coughs> so the organic standards, I think, say that if you're applying raw manure or manure tea to um, a crop that is above ground, so something like a tomato, then you can apply raw manure 90 days before harvest. But if you are applying it to land that will be growing crops that are in direct contact with the ground, you need 120 days. We have very little land and we can't really leave any of our growing space fallow. So to get around that, we basically apply, we compost our manure and then we apply the compost. We do apply raw manure directly in some cases. Um, so if I know that like a long growing crop um, is going to be in a certain uh, bed or set of beds, I can apply raw manure in the fall or I will apply raw manure to something like garlic that's, yeah, that's planted in the fall. Um, and I do use manure tea for certain crops, usually at the seedling stage, so that I'm leaving that 90 day um, window. Um, we do let our layers run loose in the fall and they sort of run around and clean up the bugs and deposit a little bit of manure, but um, mostly we are composting 
waste and applying it um, after the fact. So that's kind of how we do things on our little mixed farm. Some things that we're interested in doing in the future. Um, we are working on building some um, permanent perennial beds to further limit the amount of fer fertility that we need from off the farm. So we just built our first one this year. <clears throat> it's about six feet by 35 feet long um, and we're using the Hugo culture model. So um, it has a wood waste base. And then on top of that, there is a bunch of crop residue, animal bedding, um, manure, grass clippings, and wood chips. And in the spring, we'll cover it with topsoil and we will be planting um, just perennial herbs and some perennial vegetables and fruit in those beds. So that'll be next year will be the virgin voyage with that. And if it works out, we'd like to build more and more of those. Uh, we're really focused on composting, like I said, and closing our fertility loop. So um, one of our projects for next year is to increase the amount of compost that we're making um, and we're willing to possibly bring in manure and other sort of organic matter from off the farm, whether it be leaves from people's lawns or manure from other farms, um, cover it, put it on a better surface. Um, and that's kind of how we are going to try to increase the integration of our livestock. We have considered putting our chickens in our uh, tunnel, but we're, we, have a, we have a farmer's friend caterpillar tunnel but we are kind of worried about the damage that the birds would do to the poly. Um, and we also have permanent raised beds and chickens are not very respectful of any sort of structured um, like planting area. Uh, we're always working to increase our soil uh, organic matter. Um, we plan to stick with the methods that we're using of, of no-till and mulching and increasing organic matter in the soil so we have to use less water. And we would like to move towards organic certification because I think that's uh, climate friendly farming. That's an important element. Like we in our, our little bubble do our best to um, use climate friendly practices. But the reality is when we're buying like conventional feed for our poultry, we're supporting practices that may or may not be uh, climate friendly elsewhere. That's it. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Vicki. Um, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, that was great. Um, so I think um, what we'll do is we'll actually just go right into um, Jolene's uh, presentation of her farm and then that way we can leave um, like ample time at the end to really um, hopefully get through some of these questions. I can already see a bunch of questions coming through and I'm, I'm trying to take note of them as they come in. So um, hopefully we can get to all of them. But um, for now, I will share my screen and Jolene can introduce herself and um, yeah, and hear about uh, her operation. And if jo can Jolene, you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, great. I'm yeah. just using my phone to call in. <laughs> I see that. Yeah, yeah, it's coming up uh, separately. Okay, so. So I'm calling in from the unceded beautiful lands of the Gibson, and my farm is up in the Kispiak Valley. Um, I'm just calling in from my phone because these days our rural internet is uh, pretty sketchy. If you're having a hard time hearing me, just uh, if you can put it in the chat or let you know, and if I get cut out, then maybe Vicky can just start chatting. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, this is our farm. This is actually last winter. We're not quite at this stage of snowiness and coldness yet. Uh, next slide. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're up in the Kitsbyoff Valley, which is just about an hour and a bit north of Smithers, BC, if you're not familiar with the area, up in the northwest, so a couple hours from Vicky's farm, not quite as, as warm, but a little bit drier. Uh, we are certified organic. We've been organic for 10 years. We do market vegetables, grain and flour, um, some 
lamb for sale and then we grow some meat for ourselves as well. We also have a milk cow. Uh, we do some other livestock once in a while for personal use and then we get a lot of meat uh, products from the animals. Next slide. This is just the overview of our farm. Um, it's actually two parcels, so it's 360 acres, so a larger scale somewhat. We're still pretty small scale for having like this, this scale of livestock. The cleared area is only about 50 acres of fields and pasture, and then there's a, we do a few acres of grain, very, very small scale. So if anyone on the line is from Saskatchewan or grain country, then you might laugh at our five acres. Uh, our market garden is about one acre. We have a few high tunnels and we get our water from a gravity feed pond. This is one of the older homesteads in the valley, one of the first homesteads, and it's known as one of the places with the first running water in the valley. And that came from the little patch on the, the top right of the cleared area. There's a little, there's a pond there that brings water down to the livestock into the garden. Um, yeah, we're zone four and been growing for about 10 years. Next slide. Uh, so th this is just a little bit of a close up of our market garden. You can see um, the little letters there are part of our rotation. So every year we change which area a crop is in. We'll go from roots to leafy greens to potatoes to onions. So we always make sure we're not planting the same crop into the same area. This avoids any kind of disease or pest buildup. Um, similar to Vicky, we also use different mulches. Um, we don't use the throwaway plastic mulch. We use some, but we do use some reusable plastics. Um, we do, I have experimented with cardboard or not, car, yeah, cardboard, but also uh, paper, paper mulch, which has been pretty effective. It's nice to have something that breaks down. Um, and just on the right there, this is just kind of a sampling of some of our vegetables that we produce at the market. Uh, next slide. I'll just introduce you to our animals. So we have Hazel front and center. She's our milk cow and that's her calf strawberry. Um, we have a small flock of chickens, mostly for personal use. We do meat birds once in a while. We have uh, chicken tractors for that. Um, we have, that's ramen the ram. So we have breeding animals, which is something to consider if you're getting into livestock. Do you want to have breeding animals? Uh, they can be, you know, they take a little bit more work, keeping them separate, keeping them, keeping the genetics good in your population. Um, yeah, but uh, he's a good guy. Uh, also have the sheep, which aren't on here. Um, but uh, you'll see some of them. We have about 13 breeding ewes. Uh, so we get about 20 some lambs per year, mostly twins, sometimes a single and sometimes triplets. And then the pigs are just a once in a while, every few years, we'll just get wieners. So this is an instance where we, we don't have breeding animals for pigs. We'll get a couple wieners from, from a neighbor. Um, yeah, it's a lot of work to keep animals year round. So before you, get into mixed farming, uh, just make sure you're ready for it. Um, cow, milk cows are great. If you have the, the dream of having a milk cow, that's, that's really great. They are beautiful, lovely animals, but you have to be there every day. <laughs> uh, so I can't emphasize that enough. Animals are lovely. Chickens are a little bit more, you know, uh, they take pretty good care of themselves as long as they're provided with the environment to do so. Of course, all animals need water all the time. Um, you can do uh, seasonal, there's a bit of a seasonality you can have with animals. So there's the breeding stock and the year round, the milk cow, you're committed for life, for their life. And for, well, you're committed. But with something like meat birds, if you get chicks, you've got, you know, maybe three, four months and then you're done. So if you're trying something out for the first time, you might want to try something that isn't a lifelong commitment, um, but as long as you can take good care. Um, next slide. Some of the perks of having animals is the byproducts. So with a milk cow, we get uh, lots of homemade butter and cheese and cream and milk. So our farm is fairly self-sufficient. We 
we could live off everything we produce here. The main things we buy from off farm are coffee and sugar and oil, though we could use more lard and tallow. Um, we do use a lot of lard and tallow. I make a lot of soap out of that. Uh, we also have wool as a byproduct of the sheep. They get sheared every year. Keep that in mind. If you want to get sheep, you can get hairless breeds. I'm not too familiar with them. They're the ones that don't need to be sheared. Our, our sheep are a, a wool breed um, and they're, they're lovely. We have a very mixed flock, so I'm, I don't have good ideas of uh, breeds of our sheep. We call them the land race, right? They're a bit of a, a ragtag team of local varieties and we're always mindful of which ram we're bringing in so that we're making sure we have outside genetics. I'll uh, pass on next slide. Uh, so yeah, and then as far as the crops go, um, we grow a little bit of grain and we have a stone mill on the farm. So we make some flour and we sell a little bit of that and use it for our own baking. We also do seed crops. So I don't, we don't grow everything as a seed crop. We still have to buy a lot of seed. Uh, having quality seed is really important and we're not necessarily in the climate to grow all types of seed well, but we do grow some things very well as part of the BC Eco Seed Co-op, a local BC seed company. So if you're looking for seed that's been grown in BC, I would recommend you check them out. Um, and we also grow all our own hay. So all those fields I was showing you before, about uh, 40 acres or so is of that is hay. <laughs> and yeah, that's hand on the bottom right. Um, the hay is another thing to keep in mind. If you have animals, ruminants are lovely. They eat grass and hay, but hay still costs money. Or if you're making it yourself, it's a lot of work. Um, but we do, and there's a lot of sweat and tears happening in the summertime. Next slide. Let's see here. So this is just to show you a little bit of like what our rotation looks like. Um, you can actually see in this picture on the left hand side that there's a couple of pigs. Those are, that's Belma and Louise. Um, they were our wieners from a couple of years ago. and. Once we were at the end of the season, what we started doing was using that mesh fencing, electric fencing, and putting them in different sections of the garden to kind of clean things up. So they, they go through the potatoes, they dig them up, they, they find treats in there, then we moved them over to the brassica section, they cleaned that up, tilled it all in. The section they're in in this picture was actually a new section, like mostly grass, so we're just getting them to, to till that in. Um, so if you need any kind of work on your soil, pigs are excellent. Pigs are really, really lovely creatures. Um, once you have your own pigs, you may have a hard time buying pork from a, a factory farm or commercially, uh, which really you shouldn't um, be very mindful of where your meat comes from. You'll learn that if you keep livestock, if you choose to go that route. Uh, on the, yeah, the next pictures, other pictures just are started in the springtime. So a little bit more of a, a spring look there. Uh, it looks like our brassica patch. Um, we also put the chickens through the section. So where the pigs are, we'll use the same mesh netting. We'll put it around a section. And we also have one section of the garden every year. Uh, it's the BC Eco Seed Club. We have a section every year where we put a cover crop. So it might be oats and rye. Um, it might be clover, uh, buckwheat. Um, and so every year a different part of the garden gets a rest and then once it's, it's gone through its, its course, we'll put the animals in there. Um, it works really well. Chickens don't like really, really tall rye. They won't do much in there, but they do like picking around for little bugs and, um, and adding their manure. So it builds fertility for the next season. Next slide. So yeah, um, just kind of a, to give, if you're, create this image hopefully that of our, this is kind of a very full circle farm. So when you have a market garden and you're taking all that vegetable matter out of the farm and selling it, bringing it to the community, you have to replace that with something. Because we have the pastures and the hay fields, the animals actually are able to take that, condense it down to manure, and then that can go back into the garden to feed the vegetables for the next season. So one great thing that animals do is they're good transporters and good at breaking down organic matter. Um, the crops have different needs. They, uh, there's inputs that go in, like I said, that come off farm like seed. Uh, most of our fertility is from on farm, but with manure, you do get more like phosphorus and potassium than 
um, nitrogen. So you might either you add more manure or you supplement a little bit of extra nitrogen. Um, learning about the soil is going to be the most important thing you can do and probably the hardest thing <laughs> if you don't, don't have a soil science background. Um, it's a fascinating world and I encourage anyone who wants to learn to grow better vegetables to get their soil tested. And um, I have a book I recommend later on um, that is really good for learning about that. Something about animals, but since we're talking about climate, is uh, to think about is methane. Um, we don't have a lot of animals and they're on a large outdoor pasture. We're not feeding them in barns or in grain. So it's a fairly minimal compared to how much carbon is going to be absorbed by that pasture and from the whole and the fertility that's coming in. And when you think about the manure that's going into the garden, another consideration is when you are using manure, you're using an organic fertilizer that's going to be breaking down the soil and probably be the right amount for your plants. You're not going to have an excess of nitrogen because when you have an excess of nitrogen, you're going to end up with nitrous oxide, which is even like 300 times worse than methane. I, don't quote me on that, but it's it's pretty bad stuff. So chemical fertilizers must be used very carefully. And um, if you can find an organic fertility source, that's uh, much better off. And so that's how we farm. We take, we use the nutrients from the land, they go into the food and uh, the cycle repeats itself. Um, next slide. So this is a slide <laughs> just to like reemphasize the point of, are you ready for animals? <laughs> uh, it's a commitment. You want to have animals that are suitable to the climate. Um, you need to think about animal welfare. These are living creatures. I personally am actually more of a plant person. My partner does more of the livestock end of things. So if you're getting into animals, make sure you're ready and willing to do all the work involved. Uh, don't expect other people to jump in there. It may not be for them. Um, make sure, do you have the infrastructure in place? Don't go picking up animals if you don't have somewhere to put them. Um, animals uh, do get comfortable with their home once they get settled in, but you need to, to have that home ready. Um, yeah, the size of the animal is something to think about. So goats are infamous for being troublemakers. Um, they are hilarious animals. Uh, we do not have goats. Uh, we thought about it, it would be nice to have some goats around to help do more browsing where the sheep, some of the pastures have some browse that the sheep and the cows don't, you know, they, they use a little bit of, but not in the same capacity that goats do. Um, however, you need to really think about your fencing, Next slide. Um, and so just a note on fencing, we use mostly electric around the farm. And there's two things to think about when with fencing is, are you keeping the animals in or are you keeping them out? So we've got a fencing around our market garden so that animals can't just go in and out of there. They never get to really get a feel for what's in there. Otherwise they would destroy it. Uh, another piece of advice around fencing is to never, um, don't build a fence until you're sure that's where you want to put it. So the nice thing about these little electric fencing lines is you can try them out for a few years. And once you've built one in the same place for long enough, you could then maybe you want to build something permanent there. Sheep require like four strands of electric wire. With cows, you can actually, and horses, you can get them down to one. Pigs too, they're, it's, they're extremely smart. And as long as the animals are happy within their enclosure, they're not going to get out. They, definitely can if they want to. This is not, you know, very secure. It's a psychological barrier. Um, but as long as they're happy, they uh, they don't go. Then as I mentioned that mesh fencing and you can see it in the back behind the chicken coop there. Um, that's our chickshaw. It's our mobile egg mobile. So the nice thing about this chickshaw is that any, a person can move it by themselves. Um, so chicken tractors and chickshaws are awesome. But uh, we used to have one that was so huge and a lot of work to move. And so we didn't move it as often as we could have. So it's something to keep in mind is that they don't need to be huge. Uh, next slide. Some other notes on infrastructure. I'll just emphasize water again in the winter time. You're going to be breaking ice or maybe you want to invest in a livestock heater. Um, automatic watering systems are highly advised for our chickens. They're on automatic water. Um, I'll show you a picture in the next slide. Uh, another thing you might want to be really good at if you want to get into livestock is carpentry, um, building hay racks. Uh, this is a picture of 
the where we're we're weaning the calf. So this is where she spends the night. And next to it is where the uh, Hazel comes in, the mama cow. And this is actually designed so that when Hazel lays down, she has to put her head under this a bar. And then when she gets back up, uh, she has to step back a bit. And that way she doesn't poop in her stall. So uh, thinking about where poop's gonna be is really important or as manure, um, managing that with livestock is uh, something to keep in mind, having easy ways to, to move and pile and collect manure is really important. Um, shelters, you wanna make sure animals have protection when they're on the elements. So we keep our sheep in every night uh, to keep them away from the predators. And we've never lost any, any sheep or really any animals. I think we lost a rooster to a grizzly bear one time, but it seems like it was a freak accident, freak incident. Um, what else? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, if Vicki talked about it yet, but um, slaughter is another thing to consider if you're doing meat animals. Um, whether you want to do it on farm or take it in is, uh, it can be a little challenging these days. Um, but I can talk more about that if people are interested. Uh, next slide. This is just a link to our Chickshaw design. It's an Elliot Coleman design. So if anyone's interested, um, you can do it online. We modified it a bit, but uh, it's great to have something on wheels that can move around. And this is our automatic chicken water. Uh, so when you have animals, where's your water coming from? Do you don't wanna be hauling buckets? Same thing with the market garden. Any water access is so important and you wanna be careful on where you're spending your time. And next slide. The slide is just uh, mostly is a lot of things we've, I've talked about already, so I won't get into things. I'll maybe go let us go to questions. But here are a few books I would recommend if you want to get into ruminants. There's the Art and Science of Grazing. Uh, we do all rotational grazing with our animals. This way, the pasture has a chance to recover, and we're not overgrazing. Um, it also moves the animals to the landscape. Um, the Intelligent Gardener is the book I recommend for soil. If you really want to get into like nerding out about soil science and what your soil test means, it's it's really great. Um, Teeming with Microbes is also a really great book because soil is about more than just the minerals and nutrients. It's also the soil life. Um, and yeah, uh, you are what you eat eats. Uh, so that's our cow who's aptly named Radish below. Um, and the great thing about having animals on the farm is that when you have a market garden, you, you often have a lot of excess veggies and that goes straight to the animals. They process it, turn it into manure, the manure goes back into the garden and the cycle repeats. So animals and, and uh, market garden go really well together. Um, but if you, if you want to do animals and if you have the capacity, uh, one or the other, it's sometimes enough. <laughs> And I'll pass it back to Emily to go through questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jolene. That was that was great. Um, so yeah, so we'll just jump right into questions. I know a lot of questions have come through as um, as the as everyone has been presenting. Um, I I apologize in advance if I miss any. Uh, I sometimes it's just hard to to go through them all, but. Um, but feel free to keep throwing them into the chat and I and I promise to try and get through as many as I can. Um, so um, I guess maybe one of the the first questions that I see here um, is for Vicky and um, someone's wondering if you've ever ex uh, experimented with electro netting to hold your layers on or only the desired areas for manuring and then in brackets weed control. Um, we have not, um, we, like I said, because of food safety issues, we, and the fact that all of the, the land that we're, um, growing on, we're growing on it all, all the time. There's no rest period. So we wouldn't want the poultry on there anyway. Um, we would be moving them in a rotation, uh, the layers, we would be moving them along with the meat birds and the, the pastured rabbit. And we're, we're sort of maxed out. Um, if we want the, the ground to be sort of clean and healthy for the next time, a, uh, like a tractor goes over it, we can't have any more animals doing that. So we just this, this uh, fall cleared another area 
Um, we're going to build a different coop with sort of like a different um, pen rotation system to sort of improve the quality of life a little bit more. The other issue that I have with the electric fencing is our, our biggest predation issue here is birds of prey. So we kind of have that sort of string system where you have cords running at odd angles across um, the movable run for the chickens. And um, I mean, maybe we'll incorporate some electric fencing eventually, um, but that might be further. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, this is a question for, I, um, I suppose uh, whoever wants to answer it, but um, someone's just wondering what specific cover crops you've had successes with. Can I go first, Jolene? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, this year we did oats and peas, and they were amazing. Uh, we had a very cool wet summer, and so we had they were like uh, shoulder high, tons of organic matter, and we put the chickens in there and they made good work of it, broke it down, um, it fed them, it fed the ground. Uh, we've done rye, we've done different grains in the past because we grow grain. So it'll be some, it might just be like, oh, we need a cover crop, we'll use some of our grain. Legumes are great obviously because they're nitrogen fixers. So when we can, we try to use clover um, and peas. And uh, we don't really use vetch because chickens are, uh, it's poisonous to them. But otherwise we, yeah, legumes are great. Uh, peas, peas and oats also my favorite. This year I had a hard time getting enough peas so I actually um, ended up ordering lentils. So I did a lentil, oat and buckwheat mix and the lentils were incredible. They, they germinated in super cold temperature. They're, they're a moderate nitrogen fixer only, but um, we had a really cold year here. So I was actually grateful for the fact that I had a legume that could grow it all. Um, I have tried rye um, and clover, which like the, the root mass and the organic matter is incredible, but being a no-till farm, it was a bad scene. It was really hard to, uh, to get rid of that. Um, if we had maybe more time to cover it and let everything decompose, I think it would have been a great choice, but because we're sort of planting things as soon as we can until the very end of the season with uh, like a number of successions in between, um, the clover and the rye were just not a good choice for us. Yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe you both could uh, talk a little bit about your slaughter setup. Um, and if you use an abattoir locally or what that looks like. I'll let Vicky go. We, we use an abattoir uh, other than our personal animals. So I'll let her talk about her setup. Uh, we are very, very lucky in that we live in a special designated area, which means that we do not have an abattoir that's close enough to our community. So like the, the travel basically makes it like not economically viable, viable and also potentially very stressful for the animals to be taking them to the closest abattoir. So we have our own, it's called a class D on-farm slaughter license, which allows us to up to like actually quite a bit of meat, uh, quite a bit of animals we can, we can process on the farm and we can also process other people's animals as long as we are the ones doing the slaughtering. Um, so we have sort of like a, like a, a canopy, canopy tent and um, plastic, like non-porous tabletops. And we set up outside, we have to move the setup every time we slaughter. Um, and there's a bunch of cleaning procedures, but we can process our own meat. We can sell it directly to customers. Uh, we can also sell it to, to like retail stores. Um, we cannot, however, like butcher our animals. So we sell all of our rabbits and our poultry whole. And if we wanted them to be parted out, we would have to take them to the local butcher. Hmm. Um, our next question is, um, do either of you have experience uh, with mixed farming on slopes or maybe particularly hilly uh, areas? I, I have none. 
Um, but uh, look to the Mediterranean because they do some crazy stuff on those rocky sort of hills and crops. That's the best I have. Yeah, we're not on uh, too slopey here, but uh, yeah, I'd also recommend looking into key line design. Um, and Sepp Holzer permaculture, he's done a lot of terrace type systems. And I think there's someone in terrace who does a lot of Google culture on their slope, so which works well at a smaller scale. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what specifically. Uh, again, like animal, the great thing about animals is that they can take advantage of slopes and hills where you may not be able to grow things easily, but the animals can go up and get nutrients and bring nutrients up there, bring nutrients back. Mm. Um, there's another question for you, Jolene, and it was uh, to if you could explain more about the anti-pooping bar for your cow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's, if it has a name or not exactly, um, but it's basically just a round bar. It's at a certain height or just like a, a pole, like a, a post. And it's just in front of the, at the end of the stall before like where you might have a hay rack. And it's just at a height so that when the cow gets up, they have to kind of step back a little bit. Um, if you want to uh, email me, I can see if I can find out the name of the bar. We've heard about it from a farmer of ours who does dairy on the island. Awesome. Um, are you able to maybe just pop your email into the chat box and that way if if anyone wants to take it down and then maybe inquire a little bit further about that they can. Thank you. Um, um, so I guess uh, someone else is wondering specifically for Vicky what kind of scale and numbers you're doing with your meat rabbits um, and then if you could share maybe some current market prices um, and pound live weight. Sure. Um, I, I saw a few questions about breeds and whatnot and also how we house them. So <clears throat> I think the housing one was up a little bit farther. Um, we have the rabbits that we uh, butcher and then we have our breeders. So the rabbits that we butcher are um, in tractors and our breeders mostly live in hutches. So that is how we uh, sort of harvest that rabbit manure. We do allow those breeders to have what we call vacations in the rabbit tractors throughout the season, but mostly they live in a hutch system. Uh, we mostly have Champagne d'Argent rabbits. Um, it's sort of a, a medium sized <clears throat> meat rabbit breed. Our favorite though is, is um, a Californian Champagne d'Argent cross. We do not raise uh, New Zealand's we're also not a fan of uh, crossing with the giant breeds, which is pretty popular. Um, those, those giant breeds, or even if they are crossed with a smaller breed of rabbit, they often take a lot longer to finish and they don't have a very good bone to meat ratio. So we really like the Champagne d'Argent because they have a really fine bone structure. So like the, the final, the dressed weight uh, is a lot of meat versus a lot of bone. And we sell our live weight, I don't know, but dressed weight, we sell our rabbits whole, uh, shrink wrapped and frozen at $7 a pound. And we're usually dressing them out. Um, I think our average this year was like 3.75 pounds or maybe 3.5 pounds. Uh, and then the scale, um, we try to breed um, each of our does three times a year. Uh, we, we try for three successful litters a year. Rabbits um, are one of those species that produce a lot of offspring frequently, um, but there's also like a decently high mortality rate. Uh, and a lot of that can be corrected for with management, but a lot of times it's just, they are, they're rodents after all. Um, uh, so I think we have right now, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven does and three bucks. I think that's all of those questions. Sorry. Um, another question uh, for, for you both is um, if any of your customers ask for um, GAP certification or good agricultural practice certification? And if so, um, uh, or yeah, maybe you could answer to that first and then um, maybe answer or sort of speak a little bit to um, how, 
how to address um, having animals uh, mixed with vegetables when it comes to food safety and things like that? Uh, yeah, we don't um, get, I've never been asked that. Uh, I don't think many people know what that is yet, although I, I, it's definitely becoming more common. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, Canada GAP is good agricultural practices and it's a food safe certification that is definitely often required in like the larger chain grocery stores, although it might depend on like leafy greens, which are higher risk compared to root crops. Um, we don't have a uh, gas certification. We're selling direct to the customer for the most part. Um, and it can be a bit expensive for a smaller scale farm. Um, we are certified organic, which does have some of its own, it does not intentionally have food safety built in, but those like pre-harvest interval requirements uh, do provide some guidelines, some baselines. So, you know, you can't just apply manure anytime to your vegetables. You need to be mindful of, is it composted? Or if it's not, then have you met those pre-harvest in intervals of 90 or 120 days? We generally apply our manure in the fall to just avoid that risk. Um, and then also sanitizing surfaces and containers, having non-permeable tables and washing stations and having just a really good clean uh, setup and obviously keeping the animals away from your vegetable processing areas. One of the things with Canada GAP certification to, is, uh, or just uh, good agricultural practices is that things that are being grown in soil are a lot lower risk than things that are being grown in more of a sterile environment. When you have a living system, that's going to keep things in balance. When you have a sterile system, that's when you can end up with the more unfavorable um, bacteria and whatnot. Um, yeah, no, we, we're not really, we're just not at that place where we would get Canada Gap unless we, and we don't uh, sell a lot of like washed greens. We do mostly head lettuce. Um, if we started selling to a bigger store, we might go that route. I, I think it's definitely good to be familiar with those standards, um, but I'll let Vicki uh, comment on that. Uh, I'm echoing mostly what you said, Jolene, which is I've, I've actually never, uh, nobody has ever asked me about uh, GAP certification. It's something I've only ever heard of from sort of the people that are in the, the industry. We also sell um, directly to our consumers. We don't really do a lot of wholesale. I also know that uh, from a fellow farmer in town who has started selling uh, wholesale to uh, one of the larger grocery stores that that the grocery stores themselves often have their their very own uh, food safety standards um, and they sort of rate different vegetables at, at a different risk level. Um, what I would say uh, it, and also it would be a lot of work and expensive for us at our scale. I will say though that things uh, like um, like market safe, getting your market safe certification or your food safe certification, or even if you're taking a slaughter safe course, all of that information is really valuable when it comes to sort of like keeping your, your, like your vegetable processing station clean and keeping things sanitized and making sure your transportation bins are clean and all that stuff. So those like market safe is very easy and very accessible and pretty informative. Um, food safe as well. We, we have those because we also uh, bake bread and sell at the farmer's market. So um, that is required of us, but I would recommend those courses to anyone who is serving any kind of food. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah, food so safety is, is definitely important when you have animals around. Um, and if you're interested in kind of doing some research, you can actually download the Canada GAP manuals online and you can also download the Canadian Organic Standards online just to kind of read up a little bit more about sanitation um, and you know, like how far animals should be from your water source or your well or what the kind of limits are. We, we are not certified, but we refer to those standards all the time. They're very helpful. Awesome. Um, so we are getting very close to seven now, um, which is the end of our end of our webinar. Um, I just want to thank everyone who joined. Uh, it's really great to get people together and discuss a lot of these topics and climate solutions and agriculture, uh, especially right now. It's really great to come together online. Um, we really appreciate Vicky and Jolene for joining us, talking about their farm, answering 
our farms answering some of our questions. Um, we do have another webinar coming up. It's in alternative and renewable on-farm energy systems. So if anyone's interested, it's actually this Thursday um, and you can check out our event page on our website if you're interested in signing up for that. Uh, it's the same time. Um, I'll be sending out a participant survey as well and it would be really awesome to get uh, everyone's feedback. It helps us to plan future webinars and field days and, and things. Um, and of course, also this is all being recorded. So we're gonna uh, upload it into our website shortly. And, um, and so then if anyone wants to refer back to it, or if you know anyone who wanted to be here but couldn't, uh, you, could, you could send them that way as well. I'll send out the link to the recording once it's on our website and um, as well as the participant survey. Um, and again, thanks everyone so much who joined and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> thanks, Emily, Bye. thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.